welcome back once again to Continuum Meditations Discusses. The airing of the World Series this week affords me the opportunity to catch up on my review of The Exorcist's latest episode from last week, that is, last Friday, One for Sorrow. And, as always, my review is going to be a review-slash-analysis of the program incorporating spoilers from this season and spoilers from the previous season. So if you have not for whatever reason caught up on all of your viewing of The Exorcist and you don't want to be spoiled, well as per my normal thing, I will give you fair warning that this will be a spoiler filled analysis of the Exorcist TV series. So with that being said, and uh, that warning being given to you, let's get started. Uh, the first scene, as a matter of fact, is, starts out with Mouse and Father Devin Bennett in this particular episode. And Mouse has captured the integrated Dolores Navarro, Sister Dolores Navarro, who herself was a professional Catholic exorcist and she is torturing the integrated demon inside of Dolores, Sister Dolores, for information. Now, my question was this as I was watching this scene. Father Bennett says that Dolores Navarro was one of the Catholic Church's greatest exorcists in the storyline. So, I'm questioning, based upon what we understand integration to be in this particular series, how did Sister Navarro get possessed and then integrated in the first place. Now, as we come to find out, there is some kind of, or there was some kind of earthquake in Ecuador that was referenced by Mouse, which she says Sister Dolores was involved with trying to rescue survivors. Mouse was present and a witness to these events. Somehow or another, I don't know, but I'm speculating that what happened here was that Sister Dolores was gravely, mortally wounded as a result of this earthquake, perhaps. And I'm going to ask the question at this point. Was Sister Dolores afraid to die? Did she strike some kind of bargain with one of the devils who came to her in her most desperate hour and perhaps promised to save her life? If it got her life as the bargain, the bargaining chip in that process. I don't know, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering because this woman is supposed to be a great woman of faith in the storyline. She's supposed to be a great exorcist. How did she get integrated? And did she possibly strike up a bargain of some kind with a demon in order to preserve herself? And if she's such a great woman of faith, why did she strike up such a bargain, if that's the case? Now, we see later on that Bennett tries to exorcise her. And of course, he gets nothing but ridicule and gets laughed to scorn by the demon. Uh, and Mouse then snatches the crucifix away from him, saying that you can't exorcise her. her. Um, the demon is fully integrated. But that's when Bennett tells her that he's seen a fully integrated individual come back from from this form of possession and he thinks it can be done again effectively on Dolores Navarro. Now what he's talking about with that of course is the previous season with Angela Rance who made a bargain with the demon Pazuzu to save her daughter Casey's life from being taken by Pazuzu when he was about to kill Casey because he wanted to try to make Angela submit to his will. In the process of doing this, Angela struck up a bargain basically telling Pazuzu to take her instead, which is what he always wanted in the first place, and because of that, he got the chance to reclaim Angela's body uh, for his own. But Angela was able to come back from that kind, from that integration, because she was able to keep a part of herself in her own mind free of Pazuzu's influence and control. And so I guess what is happening now is Father Bennett, as far as he knows, is hoping that the same thing may possibly be true of Dolores Navarro. My question has always been, is integration really permanent? 
because I struck up the question last year uh, that or the observation last year that I don't think that it really is and because of that I think it's possible that maybe just about anybody perhaps with the exception of those who willingly submit and give themselves over to this form of uh, this level of demonic possession these people most people can be saved even from so-called integration and so I'm wondering about this but it still begs the question it still leaves the question how did Dolores Navarro especially someone of her great eminence in the faith and in the church and in her line of work in the church how did she become possessed and integrated in the first place okay so the next thing I want to talk about is the foster home we see that the foster family has gathered together it looks like they have gathered together inside of Verity's room and what I want to point out about this is of course that Andy is telling them that Harper Graham the kid from the previous episode is going to be joining them at the home what is interesting here to me about this as he's just explaining this to everyone is that pretty much everybody seems to accept it except for Grace here's the thing and this has been something that I've been thinking about on, that I've been having on my mind for some time. I'm, I didn't mention it in my previous video, but I'm sure there are many of you out here who have been thinking along similar, if not the same lines as I have. No one is acknowledging grace in this episode, even with her sitting supposedly right there in the room with everyone else. No one has even talked about Grace during this entire course of this of this season for the first four episodes that we've seen so far, except for Andrew, Andy. He's the only one who has had any kind of interaction with her, and that includes now the social worker, Rose Cooper, who has come to see how things are going in this household. So I started to think for a little bit now, Grace isn't real. How many of you have thought that? And I have started to think that Grace is not just not real, some figment of um, Andy's imagination, but that Grace is a ghost, okay? Um, maybe a human spirit that may have been or would have been possibly the child of Andy and his deceased wife, Nicole. It's, it's, just, it's not just that, that this kid is weird, but that she, nobody interacts with her, even in the... The, the most communal of scenes, if you will, where everybody is around one another. Nobody looks at her, nobody hugs her, nobody strokes her hair, um, nobody even does anything as much as give her a doting glance in her direction to say, hey Grace, what's going on today, kid? Um, except, of course, for Andrew. And this hasn't, this has seemed strange to me. Hasn't it seemed strange to anybody else? So, I'm thinking that this kid is not just a figment of Andy's imagination. This kid, I think, is a ghost, a human ghost, who is under the control of this demonic spirit that is in the house. Now, why do I say that I think she is a ghost instead of the demon itself? Because two things. The first instance, of course, is in this episode where Andy is sitting down with her having his little tea time, quote-unquote, with her, and she says that she does not want to come outside to meet Harper and then she kind of reiterates that by being more insistent at, by saying I don't I said I don't want to but then she looks off to the side like she's looking at the wall or something and she goes into this kind of blank state and Andy says Grace who are you talking to and she says no one and then the table moves and shakes and everything falls off of it and then she kind of comes back to reality, quote unquote, as it were, and she looks back at him like she doesn't even know what's happened before. That's the second time. The first time is when uh, they're all gathered around the room and everybody's saying, you know, she's saying she doesn't want Harper Graham to come there. Then she storms out of the room like a little kid, of course, and like a little kid would, that is. And then she runs to the front door and then... Andy chases after her and he finds her there and then he turns her around and she says she shouldn't be here and she says it all monotone and blank in the face and everything and then when the door slams behind her after all of that is said then she snaps out of it again and says Andy I'm scared as if she doesn't know what's going on okay so that's the that's the first instance the third instance that makes me think that she is a ghost 
under the control of us of a more powerful spirit is when Harper Graham actually reaches the island. Everybody is outside greeting her, including, of course, Father Marcus and Father Tomas, who have now arrived. And then when we center back on grace, things start start happening. Uh, the, the wind starts blowing through the house. Objects start falling off of tables. The uh, the vase on the table in the in the in the great room or in the foyer of the house starts to rattle and stuff like this. And then you see Grace on the staircase, and she gets up and she runs away, kind of real quick, like she's scared. Well, to me, that seems like the action of someone who is frightened of something stronger than them. Okay, and that is why I think. It is not grace that is the, the, the demonic spirit here. Grace is being used by or under the influence or control of a much more powerful spirit than her own. Okay, And that's what tells me, in my opinion, that she is a human spirit under the control of a much more powerful demonic spirit, as I believe it is a demonic spirit in the house. Now, the other thing that I wanted to talk about with respect to uh, Grace, or oh, Grace's, or uh, should I say, Harper, Harper's arrival on the on the island is we see Verity's reaction to Marcus and Tomas arriving, and I'm wondering her, you know, kind of little eye roll there and her, you know, kind of sideways glance at them uh, makes me wonder if she has some kind of animosity or distrust toward priests. I don't think Verity is our demonic spirit. And I don't think Verity is under the, the uh, control of a demonic spirit. But I do think Verity has issues, and I'd like to know what those issues are. So that's one thing. I did forget to mention something. One of the first scenes that we see at the beginning of this episode is Tomas talking with his sister Olivia. Those of you who remember the very first season remember that Olivia was introduced. Oh man, I don't remember the name of the episode. It was, one of the, f it was the first or the second episode of the series. And we also saw that Olivia had a son, uh, Tomas's nephew, who he was very close to. And of course, he was very close to his sister. Well, his sister is talking to him. She's trying to find out where her brother is. She wants to know why he didn't show up to his, his nephew's birthday party. She wants to know why he's been on the road all this time and she hasn't heard from him. Doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know where he is. And then she finally tells him that some men who claimed to be from the church showed up at her house looking for him. And that's when, of course, when he says he gets abrupt with her and he says, I have to go. And then she tries to tell him, Tomas, tell me where you are. Will you please come home? And uh, he hangs up on her and then destroys the SIM card from his cell phone and all this and goes back inside the motel where they are and tells Father Marcus, somebody came to my sister's house looking for me. Well, they already know that they're being hunted. The question is, whom are they being hunted by? The answer to that, of course, comes from, uh, not from Mouse, but comes from the demonically in, uh, integrated Dolores Navarro. In another scene, Bennett, in the course of these events, is duped by the demon. She attacks him and tells him that the person uh, whom he's already met in Chicago is going to find, how did she put it, the old gray lion and his little cub. Well, the old gray lion, of course, as we know and come to find out from the episode, is Marcus Keene, and the little cub, his little cub, quote-unquote, is Tomas Ortega. Who is the individual that Dolores refers to as uh, the woman who sends her regards that Bennett has met before in Chicago. That's Maria Walters. She is an integrated individual who wanted to be part of the satanic conspiracy. She wanted to be part of the demonic horde. And now she is in control of events that are taking place in Chicago. That's whom the demon inside Dolores Navarro was referring to when it told Bennett, she sends her regards. Moss trying to protect his sister Olivia and her son from this by not telling her where he is, is in fact the right move until he and Marcus and Bennett can, and Mouse at this point can bring this conspiracy to heel with any other allies that they may, may potentially develop. Now, as Marcus and Tomas get on the island, uh, they begin looking around at various things that are happening and 
One of the things we see is that Father Marcus begins to spot a number of caterpillar nests, multiple ones. He sees all of the dead crows that uh, you know did this, this be, made this beeline toward the house uh, in the previous episode and, and, and killed themselves effectively. He sees this dead Pacific black dragon that the, that the, that the man from the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service talked to him about. And he starts slowly, but you know, slowly putting things together. Although I do think Marcus is kind of blinded at this point, spiritually blinded in my opinion, to some of the things happening around him. Now, why do I say that? Last year in, I think it was uh, Star of the Morning, Father Marcus made the observation that demons disrupt the natural order and start making uh, natural creatures start to exhibit strange flocking behavior, birds, dogs, even people, and other things, okay? And we saw evidence of this last season. We saw it in the dogs that recognized that there was something dreadfully wrong with Angela Rance when she got repossessed by Pazuzu and they began to growl at her when she was at her home. We saw it in Casey when she was possessed by Pazuzu in the tunnel when she was hiding from, uh, from, from Father Marcus and she was causing all of the homeless people to go crazy and act really weird and eventually they attacked Father Marcus until he told them to get back in the name of Christ and, and the power of God flowed through him and forced them back and then he chased Casey uh, until he finally found her. Anyway, these are examples from the previous season where we know that Marcus is able to recognize these strange behaviors of demons disrupting the natural environment. So when he sees these evidences on the island, it seems to me that he should be putting these things together pretty easily with a man of his experience and his, his depth of understanding. But he seems a bit off his game when it comes to understanding this. By contrast, however, Tomas is starting to get a little bit more of this these spidey senses, these spiritual antennae are growing stronger of his. I wanted to talk about the handprint ritual that uh, Andy and the Foster family have. Once again, the, the big thing about that that stands out to me, of course, is that we see that Grace is standing in the midst of everybody. I mean, everybody is there. And once again, nobody, and I mean nobody, interacts with her. You have Rose who's there, Truck is there, Caleb is there, Verity is there, Father Tomas is there, and nobody sees her come out from right in front of Rose. Rose doesn't even look down at her. So this once again tells me, until we get to the penultimate, or should I say to the ultimate scene of this story, this once again is another clue that this kid, Grace, is not real. But beyond that, Tomas also sees the handprint ritual that these uh, that this family undergoes and as they're adding Harper to their family through the handprint ritual he begins that is Tomas begins to realize hey I've seen this before where in my original vision when I was trying to exercise or when I was trying to help the possessed woman Cindy at the very beginning of this season the very first episode and he saw that on the church those handprints on the side of the church that she, Cindy, and her husband, uh, Jordy, right, used to go to a decade prior to that. The other thing that, that stood out to me, and I couldn't, I didn't put it together before a couple of episodes ago, was the girl that came out of that, I guess it was that oil slick that was in Tomas's vision, you all remember that? Well, I think that that was Grace, okay? Uh, was it this human spirit grace as I'm conjecturing that grace is a human spirit? I don't think so. I think that that was actually a demonic entity that had taken the form of grace in Tomas's vision to uh, maybe to misdirect him. But I think that that person who came out of that oil slick that, that poured out of the pinata, that was grace. I think that that was grace and I think that that was the demon. We move on from there to see Rose and Andy talking and uh, uh, when, when Verity and Harper are interacting with one another and Andy basically tells Rose that he wants her to stay. Who's watching all of this? Lo and behold, from behind, they don't see it, but we do, that's the audience. It's little Grace sitting on the stairs leading up to her room in the attic and she's watching all of this happen. Well, 
As a consequence of this, we all know what happens next. Rose is asleep in her bedroom, and this shadow being comes out of nowhere, uh, and at first she mistakes it for being Andy, then she mistakes it for being Truck, which of course, it's neither one of them. But then it stoops down over her bed, right, and begins to do these awkward little um, movements, uh, kind of crawling up the bed slowly towards her, and she's scrambling to try to turn the light on. Finally, she gets her cell phone light on, and the thing disappears. She leaps out of bed in a, in a, in a frantic panic and, and steps in this, I don't know what this is, this ectoplasm or this, this, this stuff that looks like some kind of oil slick combined with water or something like I don't know what it was, but it definitely was some kind of residue left behind by the entity. Then the next thing we hear, of course, is Harper screaming, and then Rose runs into the room to see her, you know, frolicking around, you know, uh, in the in the bed like a, a fish out of water. And she finally wakes up and says, you know, it was Harper wakes up and says it was her mom. And then, of course, Rose reassures her that her mom is nowhere to in sight, nowhere to be found. And she was just having a nightmare. I think, of course, that the shadow being tried to attack not only Rose, but it tried to attack Harper in another way, perhaps through a dream. Because this demon clearly does not want anybody interfering with its relationship, with its attempt to try to lure Andrew into its web of deceit. So it attacks the two girls who threaten to take Andrew's attention off Grace. And of course, the one that it had tried to attack with the most direct emphasis was Rose herself. What it could have or would have done to her had she not successfully turned this light on it? Oh boy, who knows? But I'm telling you, these two are in danger from now on. So we move on to Marcus and Tomas at the bar where they're, you know, chugging a couple of beers. And Marcus is telling Tomas that he feels like he's lost his connection to God. He can't feel God talking to him anymore. He can't feel God's presence in him anymore. He says that the words he speak, he speaks in terms of exorcism, those words seem hollow, they seem empty, they seem devoid of, of, of breath, they seem devoid of power and substance. Marcus, in this sense to me, kind of sounds like, to interject another kind of, uh, another franchise into this, Marcus to me kind of sounds like a Jedi who's lost his connection to the Force. For example, and he calls himself an empty pitcher, Marcus, when he saved Casey Rance in the first season, the first time he saved her, that is, when they were in the lake, you all remember that? And Casey was possessed by Pazuzu. She attacked Marcus when he found her, and this was after she, he had chased her through the tunnel and basically was chasing her all over town, and he finally found her in the lake eating a duck raw. She attacked Marcus. Marcus defended himself, but in the process of defending himself, the demon was briefly, anyway, it sounded, it seemed like exercise from Casey's body. Casey, it looks like she's actually drowned under the water, but then she comes back to life and she tells Marcus that he's coming back, meaning Pazuzu is coming back. Well, Marcus later on tells Tomas that when Casey came back to life, he could feel the power of God in his hands working through him to exercise the demon and then to bring Casey back to life. He, he, he uses the idea of God woke up from his nap. I think he said something like that. Well, that's why Marcus says he feels that he has not heard from God, that he has not felt God in weeks, even months. And that's why I say that Marcus seems to me like a Jedi who has lost his connection to the Force. And he can't feel God's presence. And so he finally tells Tomas, maybe God didn't send me an apprentice. Maybe God sent me a replacement. I personally don't believe that's true, but I think Marcus is at a very, very low point in his life and in his career right now, where he's wondering what God's purpose for him is, and he himself feels somewhat lost. So, the ultimate scene of what we get to the bottom of everything that's been going on with this kid, Grace. Verity, I guess, unexpectedly comes home from school. She hears Andy outside. She's taken aback by what she sees. We cut to the, from there and we see Andy walking upstairs with Grace and he walks inside of her room and then of course we finally see Verity and she walks into Grace's room to investigate who in the heck is 
he talking to? Who was he laughing outside with? Well, we finally begin, we walk in into the room with Verity. From her perspective, we see that Grace's room, as we have known it, is not Grace's room. It is a painter's room. There's no bed in there. There, there are no child's toys in there. There's nothing in there that we've seen that matches what, what Andy sees when he goes into Grace's room. We now see the reality of what is happening when Verity walks in the room. Old, moldy sandwiches are sitting on the floor. A painter's stand is, is there. Old paintings and other things are all around the room. The room itself doesn't look like it's been maintained. It looks uh, decrepit. And we finally see what the truth of the situation is as Verity asks, is anybody in here? The answer is no. And so we finally get to the, the, the height of the puzzle of what Verity was seeing when she was looking outside with this puzzled look on her face, this bewildered look on her face. Andrew was outside from her perspective, laughing and talking to himself. There was no kid. There was no grace. And when he walks up the stairs talking again to himself from Verity's perspective, we now know grace is not real. It is confirmed. Grace is a figment of Andy's imagination. Now Verity is wanting to know what in the frack is going on with Andy, that he's doing this. He's not crazy. She knows that. So why is this happening? So the big revelation of this entire episode one for sorrow is that grace the little girl grace is not a real human flesh and blood person i am excited to keep watching this show it's this friday show that i look forward to seeing and blast it the world series is on this week and i'm missing my exorcist tv show okay so i'm i'm a little bit perturbed by that but leaving that aside i'm really enjoying this show folks if you like the exorcist like i do Support it, watch it, help promote it, fight for this show to come back for another year. These people really know what they're doing. The writers are awesome. The, the acting is awesome. The storyline is, is awesome. And it just keeps getting better and better. So that's what I have to say this time around. And until the next review, we'll see you next time.